In the year 201 BC, the Romans were victorious over their arch-rivals, the city-state of Carthage, in the Second Punic War. This was the closest which Rome had ever come to defeat and almost spelled the end of the Republic. Fifty years later, some Romans felt that they left the job unfinished. In fact, some Romans could talk about nothing else. Learn more about the Third Punic War and the destruction of Carthage on this episode of Everything Everywhere Daily. This episode is sponsored by Kachava. Hey everyone, I wanted to tell you about Kachava, my all-in-one daily super blend. If you're worried that you aren't getting all the nutrients you need or struggling to stay on top of your health, then listen up because Kachava has you covered. Kachava puts everything in your body in one glass so you can have it all. All the superfoods, all the vitamins, all the omegas, all the adaptogens, all the greens, all the protein, all the benefits for your gut, your skin, your hair, your brain, your muscles, your heart, everything. No more compromise, no more guilt, and no other nutrition shake does all of this. They travel to the ends of the earth to source everything and then crush it up. Kachava is a powder. You take two scoops of it and just add water and blend it up, and it tastes incredible. They have five delicious flavors, vanilla, coconut acai, chai, matcha, and my favorite, chocolate. I can drink one glass of Kachava a day, and it'll keep me full for hours. Trying to manage all the supplements and ingredients you should be taking can be overwhelming and expensive. But now, Kachava makes clean, organic, superfood nutrition accessible to everyone. So, you got to try Kachava for yourself. Kachava is offering 10% off for a limited time. Go to kachava.com slash everywhere, spelled K-A-C-H-A-V-A, and get 10% off your first order. That's K-A-C-H-A-V-A dot com slash everywhere. To understand why the city of Carthage was destroyed, it's important to understand the events which led up to its destruction. As I explained in a previous episode on the Phoenician civilization, Carthage was a Phoenician colony that eventually grew to outshine its parent cities back in Lebanon. Carthage, located in what is today northern Tunisia, had an extensive trading network as well as colonies scattered all about the Mediterranean. As the young Republic of Rome began expanding out of the Italian peninsula, it started to butt heads with the Carthaginians especially on the island of Sicily. This resulted in a series of wars between Rome and Carthage, called the Punic Wars, which is derived from the Latin word for Phoenicia. The first Punic War lasted 23 years, from 264 to 241 BC. It was primarily fought on Sicily and at sea, and it was arguably the largest naval conflict ever fought in the ancient world. The war was won by Rome, who managed to extract reparations from Carthage and completely annex Sicily as a Roman province. 23 years later, in 218 BC, another war erupted between Carthage and Rome. The Second Punic War was the largest war that Rome had ever seen up until that point, and it almost destroyed the Roman Republic. The Carthaginian forces were led by their brilliant general Hannibal, who was perhaps the greatest general in the ancient world. He imported African elephants to Europe and fought the Romans on the Iberian and Italian peninsulas. Hannibal delivered two of the greatest defeats to Rome in its history. At the Battle of Lake Trasimene, Hannibal's forces killed approximately 25,000 Romans in one of the greatest ambushes in history. Then at the Battle of Cannae, on which I did a previous episode, Hannibal killed almost 50,000 Romans in what is considered one of the greatest set-piece battles in all of history. The Romans eventually learned that the best way to fight Hannibal was not to try and defeat him, but just to keep him at bay and try not to lose. This strategy, developed by Quintus Fabius Maximus, became known as the Fabian Strategy, and it worked insofar as it kept Rome alive. Eventually, the Romans realized that if the main Carthaginian threat was in Italy, then no one was minding the store back in Carthage. So Rome sent a general, Publius Cornelius Scipio, to Africa, which managed to get Hannibal to come out of Italy. It was there that the Romans finally beat Hannibal at the Battle of Zama in 202 BC, and Publius Cornelius Scipio became Scipio Africanus. Carthage agreed to punishing peace terms, abandoning all of their overseas colonies, the loss of most of their land in Africa, and an enormous war reparation of 10,000 silver talents which had to be paid over the course of 50 years. There was one other term to the peace treaty which became relevant later on. Carthage could not wage war with anyone unless it was first approved by Rome. 
Carthage was effectively rendered a single city-state, was no longer a threat to Rome for supremacy in the Mediterranean. Fighting at the Battle of Zama, there was a local ruler by the name of Massinissa, who was the leader of the Numidians. Massinissa was a staunch ally of Rome and supported them against the Carthaginians. Numidia was basically everything on the coast of North Africa from the middle of Libya through the coast of Algeria to northern Morocco. Massinissa and the Numidians were Berbers, ancestors of the Berber people who still live in the region today. After the Second Punic War, Massinissa took advantage of this relationship with Rome and the onerous peace treaty with Carthage. He would constantly attack Carthaginian territory, and the Carthaginians couldn't do anything about it. They would appeal to Rome to let them go to war, but Rome would always deny their request. Massinissa ruled for a really long time. Having come to power just before the Battle of Zama, he spent the next 50 years harassing Carthage. Back in Rome, Carthage had been put on the back burner. They weren't a threat anymore, and Rome had bigger things to worry about. That changed in the year 152 BC, when a delegation of senators was sent to Carthage to mediate a dispute between Carthage and Massinissa, who was now 87 years old. One member of the Roman delegation was an elderly 82-year-old senator by the name of Marcus Porcius Cato better known to history as Cato the Elder. And he was given that title not because of his age, but because another notable Cato came 100 years after him. Cato was a veteran of the Second Punic War, and was shocked at what he saw in Carthage. Carthage was still an incredibly wealthy city. What he saw convinced him that Carthage was still a threat to Rome. Their wealth made them an economic rival, and with enough money they could easily become a military power once again. When Cato got back to Rome, he made the destruction of Carthage his primary mission. In particular, every time he got up to talk in the Senate, regardless of the subject he was talking about, he would always end his speech by saying in Latin, Carthago delenda est, or Carthage must be destroyed. Here I should note that he actually didn't use those exact words. The phrase is just a modern shortened version that's easy to remember. What he probably said was something along the lines of Kentrum Kenseo Carthaginium Esse Delendum, which means, furthermore, I consider that Carthage must be destroyed, which, if you think about it, actually makes a lot more sense. The shorter phrase, Carthago Delenda Est, is often adapted as a reference for anything which should be destroyed. For example, Chicagum Ursus Delenda Est means the Chicago Bears must be destroyed, an opinion of which I'm sure we all can agree. While Cato was adamant that Carthage had to go, most of the Senate did not share in his opinion. In fact, one senator, Publius Cornelius Scipio Nascia Corculum, the son-in-law of Scipio Africanus, basically countered Cato by saying the exact opposite after the end of every one of his speeches. Corculum was probably the most powerful man in the Senate at the time, and there was a good chance that he was even in the same delegation as Cato to Carthage. He felt that Carthage was necessary so Rome would have a rival. While in reality Carthage was no threat at all, they could be used as an excuse to increase support for Rome amongst the Publians. The stories of Hannibal were burned into the minds of Roman citizens, and a neutered Carthage could keep the threat alive. He would end each of his speeches, again regardless of the topic, with Carthago Serwanda Est, or Carthage Must Be Saved. In 151 BC, Carthage had paid off its 50-year debt, and in 150 BC, they finally got fed up with the constant attacks by the now 89-year-old Massinissa. So, they did what any country would do. They raised an army and set out to take care of the Numidians once and for all. The Carthaginian army was led by the general Hasdrubal, and they met the Numidians at the Battle of Oroscopa. Massinissa's 50 years of battle experience proved to be no match for the now inexperienced Carthaginians who hadn't really fought anyone in 50 years. Carthage was decisively beaten, and Hasdrubal was no Hannibal. Say what you want about the Romans, but they were very legalistic and always stuck to the letter of the law. One of the reasons why no one previously followed Cato's advice on destroying Carthage was that they had no excuse to go to war. Now, because Carthage raised an army and fought the Numidians without prior Roman approval, they had broken the terms of their now 50-year peace treaty. Rome had their casus belli, a.k.a. their excuse for war. In early 149 BC, Rome formally declared war on Carthage. Corculum was conveniently in Greece. Rome sent over an army and a navy headed by both consuls for that year. 
This should have been a cakewalk. Carthage didn't have much of an army, and what they did have had been soundly beaten by the Numidians. Rome landed an army of 20,000 soldiers at Utica, which was about 35 kilometers north of Carthage. When the Romans landed, the Carthaginians tried to negotiate to get out of this predicament. The Romans demanded that Carthage hand over all of their weapons. So, they did. The records show that 200,000 sets of armor and 2,000 catapults were given to the Romans. And then, they also sailed all of their warships out of Carthage and burned them in front of the Romans. The next Roman demand was something that went too far for the Carthaginians. The Romans demanded that they evacuate Carthage and move somewhere else along the coast so the Romans could destroy Carthage. The Carthaginians went back into their city to defend it. Things didn't go well for the Romans after this. The Carthaginians hadn't given up all of their weapons. The Romans attempted to scale the walls of the city but failed. The Carthaginians made repeated forays outside the city walls and were more often than not successful. The siege of Carthage actually lasted several years without any success. The only real success the Romans had came from a military tribune by the name of Scipio Aemilianus, who just so happened to be the grandson of Scipio Africanus, the general who defeated Carthage in the Second Punic War. In 147 BC, Scipio Aemilianus was 36 and was going to run for the position of Aedile. However, his battlefield success, plus his name and lineage, resulted in a grassroots campaign for him to be elected consul. The age requirement for consul was waived, and Scipio Aemilianus was elected. The tide began to turn for the Romans. Scipio Aemilianus moved the Roman camp closer to the city walls, removed ineffective troops, and began creating siege works to control the harbor. It was a slow process, but the Romans made advancements throughout the year. In 146 BC, Scipio Aemilianus had his command extended by a year, which was all that was needed. In the spring of that year, the Romans finally breached the walls of Carthage. It was a slaughter. Literally. For six days, the Romans methodically worked their way through Carthage, killing everyone they found and burning the buildings as they advanced. The death toll was staggering. The upper estimates placed on the population of Carthage was 800,000 people, which would have made it about roughly the same size as Rome. There were only 50,000 survivors, all of which were enslaved. Scipio Aemilianus received a hero's welcome and triumph back in Rome. He was once again elected consul in 134 BC and sent to Hispania, where he defeated the Celtiberian tribes and was again awarded another triumph. Cato and Massinissa both died of old age during the war. The Romans wanted to ensure that no one ever lived in Carthage again, so they sent a team back after the war to destroy any buildings that were still standing. Despite legends to the contrary, the soil in Carthage was not salted. That is a 19th century invention. But a curse was placed on anyone who might decide to live there in the future. In the year 29 BC, over 100 years after its destruction, the city was rebuilt as a Roman city named Carthage by the Emperor Augustus. 300 years later, this new Carthage was one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire. Today you can visit the ruins of Carthage, which lie about 16 kilometers east of the modern city of Tunis. There's a modern area called Carthage, which is a suburb of Tunis. And in 1985, the mayors of Rome and Carthage signed a peace treaty 2,131 years after the end of the Third Punic War. There are a great many ancient cities that are still vibrant cities today. Rome, Athens, Alexandria, and Beirut are all good examples. Carthage, however, is not one of them. This is largely due to what happened by a Roman army over 2,000 years ago who made the decision that Carthage must be destroyed. Everything Everywhere Daily is an Airwave Media podcast. The executive producer is Darcy Adams. The associate producers are Thor Thompson and Peter Bennett. I have so, so, so many boostograms to catch up on. You've probably noticed from my voice that I've been sick the last couple weeks, and I just want to thank everyone that's been listening over on the Fountain app. I get your boosts in a browser window that I have open all the time, and there's actually a sound that plays every time one comes in. And sometimes it actually wakes me up. A big shout-out goes to Petar, who's donated 1,000 sats for every episode. Also, Joel W. has been sending sats for every episode as well, and Dave Jones, who sends a weekly 12,112 sats. Other boosters include, but are not limited to, and hang on, this is a long list. Taylor Johnson, 2792, Peanut Butter Life, Gimp, 5 times 9 is 45, Andy Boley, 
Unit of ACC, Take, Phoenix, Never Other, BTC Photo, PB5433, Harrington's Dad, Rudel Luca, Carl6007, PJ Ninja, Yesterday's TNT Mom, and You Cool, Boomy, Beat Bowl, Chandler Bingcoin, Yazik, Fabo, Crypto Kingdom, Jim Seifert, Tony MH, Wildcat, Nestork, Gerard, Pat, Gene Everett, Elf Camacho, T-Man, Not He-Man. Thank you to everyone. I am pretty sure there's close to a 100% chance that I'm missing people, given how many people have been boosting over on Fountain. If you're curious as to what all this boosting stuff is about, I recommend checking out the Fountain Podcast app at fountain.fm. They have versions for both iPhone and Android, and they'll set you up with some free sats when you sign up. And remember, if you leave a review or send a Boostagram message, you too can have it read on the show.